Welcome back to Rewiring Health. I'm your host, Kelly Kessler, and I'm so excited to bring you the guest that I have on today. Becky Oste is a trauma-informed marriage coach and the host of Your Breakthrough Blueprint, a top 5% globally ranked podcast. She is the CEO and creator of I Do Breakthrough, a company dedicated to equipping high ambitious wives to reclaim thriving connection and clarity in their marriage by moving trauma out of their body. After spending a decade researching and going through every mainstream modality of healing to save her own marriage, she found herself two kids later, separated from her husband and on the verge of divorce. At the final hour, she stumbled upon the unconventional game changer of somatic work that took her marriage from dying to thriving in less than a year and has made her mission to get this into the hands of every woman possible ever since. Whether it's betrayal, addiction, abandonment, abuse, neglect, grief, or something we've survived, our body keeps the score and can become an unconscious emotional block to the connection in our marriage. And Becky gets to work with you to clear those blocks out. This is such a profound conversation and something that is so significant and can really transport people into a much better place in their relationship. I'm so honored that Becky shared her journey and her experience with us today. Welcome back to Rewiring Health and so honored to be joined by Becky Ostai. So thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me, Kelly. I'm excited to chat. Yeah, me too. And this is giving me something that is so profound that what you speak about and what you do and how you help people. So first, I would just love to hear your story. How did you get into this place where you are helping people with their marriage? Yeah, well, it's not because I've had a squeaky clean marriage or have been like the epitome of this is how you do it. It was definitely the opposite. Um, My husband and I met young in college and we got married early. I was 21 and he was 23. And I noticed pretty early on this dynamic between us that at the time, the only words I had for it was chase and run, where I felt like I was chasing, he was running. And when we were good, we were good. But when we were triggered or in a fight, that was kind of the dance. And that just picked up speed through our marriage. And so it reached its head. And over the years, I found different words for it, you know, as I got into self-development and therapy and all of the things, um, different words like codependency and addiction or anxious attachment style, that would be me. And then the more avoidant type, that was him. Uh, But it still wasn't helping. The more words I learned, I was still noticing us get further and further until year 10 of our marriage. That's when it reached its head. And we ended up separating. We were talking about divorce. It was a terrifying time. My nervous system in my journals back then was like, dear God, my nervous system is on fire. I don't, I didn't even know what that meant at the time, but everything just felt like it was falling apart. Insomnia, you know, eczema breakouts. I was crazy on this hamster wheel of achievement at work. And it seemed to be achieving more the worse my marriage got, but behind the scenes, things were getting pretty bad. And so that was when I stumbled upon somatic work, which if your listeners are new to that word, it just means pertaining to the body really in contrast to the mind. And it was the first healing modality like that I had ever came across that wasn't just from the neck up talking about things and learning or listening. It was getting into my body where I now know our body keeps the score of the trauma that we've been through. So learning how to move trauma out of my body, learning how to complete grief, learning how to regulate my nervous system. Long story short, that was what just set up on the track to surviving at first and then healing. And then now I can say thriving amazing and I love that you talk about the different you know you went through therapies and I mean that's such a relatable story so many people go through counseling think it's going to help and then don't really see much change or you know some do it's it's really dependent but like to realize that there's another way to go about it and that this was the key to saving your marriage and helping you thrive I think that's so profound to even share because Again, many people may not realize there are other options because it, it seems like the model that's explained is like, well, try counseling. If that doesn't work, then it is what it is. 
but exactly. to see that there's right. other avenues. And can you dive into your experience more talking about the somatic work and working through your body? What was the big transition where you started to see things open up and, and feel different for you? Are you the person who says yes, even though you want to say no? Are you the person who puts your own needs and wants last behind the demands of your work and everyone else in your life? If you answered yes to any of these, you may be self-abandoning, and it does not come without a cost. If you want to know if you're self-abandoning for achievement, take my free quiz in the show notes. Yeah, I did a group coaching program online. So it was a woman that I stumbled upon uh, on Instagram. And this was very not my norm to book a call with a stranger off Instagram, like any therapy I'd ever done was referred to by a friend or somebody that I knew. So that felt like, what am I doing? But it also felt very much intuitive before I really knew how to trust my intuition. It felt like I'm meant to be in her space. So it was a group coaching program. And at first, it was almost too simple. It was annoying. And it was things that triggered me because it just seemed too basic. Like I had scoured the earth and like turned over every stone and done all these, you know, intensives. And we did tried EMDR hypnotherapy. And I'm like, you're telling me to put my hand over my heart and speak self self compassionately to myself. Like I was angry. I was like, this is so stupid. I don't have time for this. I have to <laughs> save our marriage. And things like as simple as grounding techniques when you're triggered. So in a moment that was really triggering for me, uh, just for example, we betrayal trauma was like in our past. And so I was very triggered by a uh, phone vibrating, like who's texting you, who, who are you talking to, you know, and I would really lose my mind and get caught down these rabbit holes of scouring through his search history and stuff like that. So instead of continuing to do that, because my new coach was inviting me to consider that was keeping me caught in my trauma, I decided to pull for grounding techniques. So one that I used a lot was the five senses. So when I felt triggered, I would just stop and name five things I could see, four things I could hear, three things I could touch, two things I could smell, one thing I could taste. And I kept doing that on repeat every time I was triggered. And I was noticing as I was doing that more and more, the waves and the triggers felt less and in, less intense. But then my husband also started to just notice a difference in me. And if you ask him today, like, what was the change? He'll point to my energy. He was like, it wasn't something different, she said, or some new, you know, profound idea she had. It was just how I felt in Becky's presence for the first time she felt settled more slow more anchored more like she's really got herself even when he was telling me things that were under undesirable for me to hear mm -hmm. yeah wow it's and I and I love that it's just it just wasn't as as impactful each time when you went through anything so like that's such a profound point it's not like everything is like roses and butterflies all the time but it's just not impacting you in such a deep way and I know you mentioned triggers and this is something that you know I think many people know what triggers are but can you talk about triggers and what that tells us about ourselves and the information behind triggers yeah. I mean, I used to just be terrified of triggers lurking around any corner. I'm like, when's the next shoe going to drop? Like would try to control and design my day, my moments, my marriage to avoid triggers at all costs. And now I see them differently. I see them as these like gentle invitations that, Hey, there's still some unhealed wounds deeper down. Let's not be afraid of them. Let's be curious. Let's lean in and really ask, what are these triggers trying to teach us? So triggers are basically just hints and indicators that, oh, there's still some trauma residing in our body or lived experience from something we've been through in the past. It's a, it's a thing happening now that brings us back to a memory of something that happened before. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing. Like it shows that our nervous system is working. It shows that, hey, our nervous system is wisely working to protect us and wants to keep us from future danger. The problem is just when you get stuck in that mode of where like, there was a point where I didn't know when I wasn't triggered. Like if somebody had asked me, when was the last time you were triggered? I'd be like, I don't remember the last time I wasn't. I'm constantly triggered. I'm constantly mm -hmm. hypervigilant. So it's like resetting the alarm system, this work we do with nervous system regulation and, you know, somatic trauma healing. It's getting it back to equilibrium so that when there is an actual danger that the alarm does go off mm 
-hmm. But if there's not where you can tell the difference that, hey, this is just like a reminder and a replay of something that's in the past, but I'm actually safe right now. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that explanation because it just brings more clarity around it. And I want to dive into that a little bit deeper because you talked about the trigger of like the phone vibrating. I think that's something very relatable to many women. That used to be a trigger for me when I had someone who had cheated on me. And it's like, I, I can very much relate to that where you're, you almost get paranoid about every little thing and you're, you get in this like rumination cycle of what is that? And so can you talk about like when you were noticing those triggers and you're recognizing that it's information, what's the next step? What, how did you use somatics and, and really the nervous system regulation to help yourself get into a place where it wasn't triggering you as much? Yeah. For me, when I started this work, we were separated. So my husband was living at his mom's house. He would come over just for dinners um, with the kids because we were trying to not rock their world as much as ours was feeling rocked. Mm -hmm. But um, I really knew our marriage wasn't, it wasn't the, it didn't need to be the focal point at that time. We had tried for so long to fix the marriage, the marriage, the marriage. Like I really needed that separation to really focus on me. And so what I did when I recognized those triggers is I brought it to just my coaching calls. I brought it to my coach who was able to guide me through those and help me like somatically release that from my body and integrate it in a way where I felt like, okay, I have a plan going forward. Even if it's just this one week ahead, I don't have to know the whole future, but this is my best next step. Um, sharing it with the group was really therapeutic for me too. It's something that I think is underestimated but the power of an empathetic group of women that aren't just there to trauma bond and stay stuck in our past stories, but it's women who, yeah, they can relate and empathize and nod their head in a sense of like, I, I totally get it, but very forward focus too on, we want to heal. We don't want to stay stuck. We want to step back into our power. And so, um, that was, my first phase, I guess, was just focusing on me getting my help for from my coach, from my support system. And when it felt safe enough, starting to introduce that in conversation with my husband from a different energy. Like it wasn't necessarily that I became a great speaker and communicator, but it was like the energy under the surface was no longer, I'm terrified he's going to leave if I say the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. It was an energy of, I need to express my truth because this is killing me. My body is yelling at me <laughs> for keeping this buried inside. I was like a truth stuffer and it was hard for me to do confrontation. And so what I, when the time came, would start to expressed to him was basically what I had practiced with my coach and my peers all that time before I was ready to bring it now to the marriage. And so I'd say things like, when you said this, or when this happened, this is how I noticed my body respond. My throat got all tight. My, you know, I held my breath, like whatever I noticed in my body. And then I would share, these were the stories or the thoughts that were going through my head. This is how I felt. This is what I need right now. And my old, you know, pattern would be to try to get that from you or control or whatever, you know, my old dance was, but now this is what I'm doing differently to let him know this is all me taking responsibility. This is me just giving him a window glimpse into what's happening in my body and my mind when this thing happens and letting him know this is how I'm going to meet my own need. If you want to join me and support me in that, this is what you can do, but I'm going to be okay either way, you know, if you're not able to in this moment. And that was really different for us. Yeah, that, I love that. And I just love how you talk about the energy and how it, you're coming from a different place. And that that's huge when you're coming from like a place of fear. It's like you're backed up against the wall and you it's just you're a caged animal. You know, you're going to do whatever you can to like not like be hurt. And I know you said safety a lot of times. It's like, again, that nervous system, when you feel like you're not safe, you're going to just react. And so I love how, when you talk about the transition of your energy, that you're approaching it from a different place. And then can you talk about how it was received from your husband where, from where you were to where now you're coming at it from a different energy? Yeah. I kind of laugh at that question because at first it was not received well. And with many of my clients at first, it's like, where the hell is my wife? Like, who is this? And where is my wife, you know, type energy. Yeah. Um, 
because our nervous systems even don't know the difference between what's good and what's bad. It only knows what's familiar and what's fam- what's unfamiliar. So I've seen that quote sw- circulated on Instagram, like it'll it'll choose a familiar hell over an unfamiliar heaven any given day of the week. So for my husband, this was just unfamiliar. Like, who is this? <laughs> Becky is showing up like this, not needing the conversation to go a certain way, not, you know, um, cleaning like a crazy person or hustling in her business. Like she's actually taking a bath, you know, and lighting some candles or like going slow and talking from a grounded energy. Mm -hmm. And so he actually would mock me at first and like make fun of my healing work and all of that stuff. And you paid how much money and things like that until he saw that it wasn't a phase and that it was like actually staying in a new reality. And he saw me become happier again. He saw me get confident. He saw me be able to find peace and communicate that Sebastian ultimately is my husband's name. Ultimately, I still desire and hope that our marriage works out. But for the first time in my life, I actually not only know that I'm going to be okay if it doesn't, I feel that I will be okay. And I'm just letting you know where I'm at. And that was really what started to open the door for him to feel safe to move towards me again and start to want a taste of what I had in my cup. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so do you notice more of like a curiosity on his mm-hmm. end? Yeah. How is yeah. important how important is it for the spouse to also want to be involved in the process? Is that important as far as the marriage or is it more about like you coming from a different place and being okay w- regardless of the outcome? Or is it about also having your partner being on board or maybe doing some of the same tools that you're doing? I love that question. And it's probably number one question I get from people like seeking extra support is does my husband have to be on board for this to be able to work? And my quick answer is no, he doesn't. What I tell all of my clients is as you heal, you're either going to call him up or you'll call him out. But either way, you get to heal. And it's two best case scenarios here. First best case scenario, you really heal on this deep subconscious cellular spiritual level. And he wants a taste of that and wants to rise with you. Typically, I see it's the woman going first. That's Mm -hmm. like a whole nother conversation for another time as far as like why I think that is. And it's all theories. But um, second best case scenario, you heal on the deepest subconscious cellular spiritual level. And now you stop abandoning yourself and you find peace because peace really just comes from trusting your own intuition. Mm -hmm. For so long, I thought peace could only come if the outcome looked like this. Mm -hmm. And so I find women, you know, having different outcomes and we celebrate both in my client community. Some it's like, wow, your marriage was saved after abuse, infidelity, you know, abandonment, whatever the things are. And we celebrate that. What a miracle. And also the women who's saying, you know what, as much as I didn't want this to be true at first, my intuition is saying to either take a break or, you know, to completely go separate ways. But I actually feel at peace about this and I'm in my power. And I've seen women go on to live their best life thriving, both outcomes. I love what you just said too, because it is so true. So many of us look outside of ourselves for peace, but when you realize that peace is literally within yourself, it doesn't matter the outcome because you're in the place where you want to be and you're in the feelings that you want to feel. And so I, I absolutely love that. And that that's such a huge empowering statement to realize like all along, you have the power to feel you feel the way you want to feel regardless of what someone does or says, or what the outcome is. And that's, That's tremendous. And one thing I want to get go into a little bit more, and you said it was self-abandonment. And this is something that many, many women do and in many ways, whether it's marriage or, you know, it's just self-abandoning through achievement, but you're always putting yourself on the back burner. Can you talk about that and your journey of going from where you, maybe you were self-abandoning to now prioritizing yourself? Yeah, man, it can just show up in every area. Like you said, I think highest to like most blaringly obvious is one in my career, I was self-abandoning in the sense of not honoring what I 
in my body needed as well as what I valued for the sake of achievement in my career. Cause I had this like background story idea that if I could just make it to the next level in my career and show my husband, like then he's going to be able to rest and I can rest and we'll be able to be at peace. And it was this constant carrot on a stick that that exact energy of like being strung out on hustle was mm. actually the energy repelling him from me. And so I valued presence. I valued my family. I valued being a mom who could get on the ground and play with her kids. But when I was stuck on that hamster wheel, I wasn't able to do any of that. I was constantly staying up late, working, distracted on my phone, you know, not able to be playful because there's so much work that has to be done, snapping at my kids. So just really living out of alignment um, in that area. And then in the marriage, I think the most obvious way was just not speaking my truth. I could tell my girlfriends, like, this is what it is. Let my hair down, let it all out. And then as soon as I turn to talk to my husband, it's like, I would want to tell him everything that was on my mind and spinning through my head, but my body had other plans and I would just shut down, button up, say what would appease him, say what I thought he wanted to hear, um, try to manipulate his affection in another way, whether it's through sex or cooking him his favorite dinner, or bringing him home a gift, like anything, but just to speak the terrifying truth of, Hey, I feel disconnected. and I don't know what to do with this. Yeah. Yeah. And then that, that sense of, you know, when you do speak your truth, the, what's the reaction going to be? And then it's like, that creates that lack of safety again within your system. And was it again, the somatic work that helped you feel safe to express that? Or was there more that you dove into to get to a point where your system wasn't reacting in a way and that you could let your guard down and actually speak your truth? It was the somatic work. And this is why if like listeners don't remember one thing from anything I've said, I hope they remember this one. And it's that our body, we've all got this vagus nerve that runs from, you know, the base of our skull to the bottom of our spine. And it's like the super highway of information where neurotransmitters and chemical messages are constantly running up and down, sending messages from like the brain to the body, body to the brain. Now of all those messages being sent, only 20% go from our brain to our body, but 80% go from our body to our brain. So all those years where I was attempting to say the right thing, use the communication skills I learned in therapy, talk it out in therapy, talk it out in couples counseling, read this book, listen to this podcast. All of these things was just working with the 20%. Mm -hmm. So it's not like it's useless. It, it helped some, but I also felt like a salmon swimming upstream. So when I got into that 80% and learning to like leverage the power of my body and work with my nervous system and pair up and be like, we're doing this together. That was the first time that I was able to feel safe enough to express my truth. Mm -hmm. and stop shaming myself for so long. I was like, what's wrong with me? You're insecure. You can't speak up. You're codependent. Like I would just name call myself to all hell. And then it wasn't that it was just, oh, nobody taught me that I'm swimming upstream. Like mm -hmm. learning to work with my nervous system is actually way easier. hundred <laughs> percent. And like, I love that you just shared that too, because that is, that's it. Like just recognizing the power that you have within yourself and that your body is literally the that's the, the truth seeker and the truth sender. And it's going to tell you exactly where you are. And I, I think just that is such a key point. I'm so glad you shared it because that's something that if for anyone listening that hasn't pursued that avenue, here you go. Like this is a huge key piece that maybe you've missed this whole time. And this could literally be the key to opening up your life and whatever you want in your life. So I am so grateful that you shared that. And I want to um, go into more about how can we create harmony in some of the closest relationships that we have, because this can be something like, even if it's, you know, whether it's a marriage or a family member or children, like, how do we create that? And is it within ourselves or is it creating it between others that we mm -hmm. care about? Yeah, I think where we get stuck is we think, yeah, harmony, our mind immediately goes to a relationship with two people. But from what I found, getting fixated on that before doing the work of finding harmony in yourself first 
is where we get tripped up because you can't have something that you don't first know how to hold yourself, to offer yourself. And so it sounds nice, right? Like, oh, harmony in myself, cool. But like, practically speaking, what I've found is that learning these tools has been the only thing that has helped me really be able to experience like, oh, this is what that word alignment means. Like I'm in alignment, meaning my actions and my values are like lining up. I'm not valuing one thing and then doing a completely different thing. Like for the first time I feel safe enough to integrate the two. And like, I'm actually showing up as her. I've never showed up as her. Wow. This is what it feels like. And then that is what I've just seen spill into the relationships around you. Cause people can feel that too. That's, it goes back to that. That's what Sebastian sensed. Like, whoa, there's a, a harmony in her. I've never felt before. And that was the key to restoring that harmony with, you know, within the marriage. Yeah, I love it. And it's like, I, or there's a quote I just recently heard, you can't connect with people who are not connected with themselves. And it's literally what you say. I mean, that that's so true. And I've experienced that in my own life, like trying to force things and things will never be forced. You have to attract them with the energy and it's just recognizing where your energy is. And I want to go more into like that alignment. And like you talked about intuition earlier. Can you talk about that? Like that deep knowing of ourselves, how did you cultivate that in yourself? Did you always have it? Or is it something you had to really learn throughout this process to know your own truth? I believe we're all born with intuition, like able to trust ourselves from a very early age. I mean, it's it's even kids when you see them, like just have a weird vibe about a stranger, you know, and I believe that that is built into us, that there's this knowing um, on a kind of unseen level that something is safe or not safe or what we should do. But I think along the way, there's a lot of different reasons that we all can have this like corroded relationship with our intuition and so many different reasons. But for me, one was, I mean, it's just not what I was taught in the house growing up. Like I was taught to obey my parents and that's it. Like if I asked why it's because dad said so. (laughs) So (laughs) there was never an invitation to be like, how does that feel for you, Becky? Or like, what do you think is best? Mm -hmm. So, and that's okay. It's just like nineties parenting. It is what it is. And then also the church culture that I was a part of for a long time had its beautiful parts to it, but there was also a high emphasis on just trusting authority and that your heart is deceitful and to not trust yourself because that's your sinful desires. And so there is a lot of spiritual trauma, religious trauma to work through as well to find out that my intuition is actually not a threat. It's like a beautiful gift from God, higher power source, whatever you call it. Um, And then the third area is if there's any kind of abuse or gaslighting, you know, in your journey, uh, that is going to teach you to not trust yourself real quick. So for example, when my husband was deeper in his addiction, I would sense something, my intuition and question him about it. Like, is something up here that felt off? No, no, no. What do you, I don't know what you're talking about. Everything's fine later to find out. Nope. Things were not fine. There was like definitely truth that was revealed later about that situation. So it taught me along the way, like, oh, my intuition always was trying to, you know, give me that nudge or sense that, Hey, something's off or, Hey, this is the path you should walk in. But I just didn't know how to trust it. So that was what I learned practically how to do that, um, for the first time. And gosh, intuition is like a whole podcast episode. We could get into the practicals on it, but I think it's first important just to identify that the reasons that it doesn't exist for many people or like there is no trust of self that it's not your fault and there's no need to shame yourself there's a lot of valid reasons for why it might not be strong right now but like any kind of muscle you can flex it yeah thank you for sharing that it's it's again that external forcing and having to look outside yourself for all the answers and i you can look at it in so many ways like even our medical system, we don't know our bodies, but somebody else knows our body better than us. And that's, that's another way that we externalize those things and give people more validation than our own inner feelings and, and, uh, and, and using our intuition. So I appreciate you sharing that because that is such a relatable thing in so many ways and so many aspects and huge part and contributor to why 
many of us maybe struggle with really trusting ourselves. And one thing I want to like, like kind of go off of that is like when we are in alignment, you talk about alignment, what does that feel like in our body? So how would someone know like, oh yeah, okay, that, that feels right. Like what sensations do you notice when you're in alignment versus being out of alignment? Oh my gosh. I love that question. And one of the coaches on my team, we've got, you know, it's a group coaching program, but we have client support coaches for the one-on-one monthly individualized support. And one of my coaches came up with this ego versus intuition slide deck. And I can give it to you if you want to put it in the show notes. I literally refer to it so much. I'm constantly giving it to my clients. If they're in any kind of crossroads, do I stay or do I go in my marriage? Um, Should I go on this business trip or not? You know, big to little things, but Ego kind of in general can feel loud and demanding. It's kind of this energy that's scrambling for safety. It can feel constrictive or suffocating. Restless energy feels like fear or survival energy. Um, But intuition feels more like a quiet whisper. Like it knows it's safe, even if the truth is undesirable. So those clients I was mentioning where it's like, I know I'm going to be safe. I separation is what's in the the cards for me. That's not what I wanted, but that's their intuition, right? Um, It feels more expansive and freeing. It feels like love. It settles in your body. It's not chaotic or ruminating. It's thriving energy. And so she has like a whole slide deck of many more things, but in general, that's kind of my favorite way to paint the picture of the differences. Yeah, I love that. And again, it's just, it's again so relatable. I mean, you can I think everyone who's listening to us can experience and think back of a time like they they felt that way, like constricted, tight and feeling their body like that heart pounding like this does not feel good. It literally like a bear is in front of you like that feeling versus feeling like oh my god, like this feels great, you know, that joyous like expansive feeling. So I I love that you differentiate that because that's such a great way to for someone to indicate whether they're on the right path or maybe not on the right path. And so thank you for sharing that. And for someone who wanted to connect with you and go further and really work with you, where can they find you? Yeah. Instagram, Becky underscore Oste, A-S-T-E. And I have a free training. I can give it to you, Kelly. It's three secrets to thriving intimacy. It's just a quick 20 minutes of what I wish I had known 10 years ago to save me the suffering that I encountered in my marriage. And so I'm happy to share that with anybody that wants a free resource. Yeah, that would be great. And I'll, I'll put everything in the show notes. So for anyone listening, definitely check that out, grab the free resource and start your journey to feeling more expansive and free in your life. And I just want to thank you again for everything you shared today. And I really know this, these messages are going to help somebody who's maybe feeling really stuck in a relationship and is maybe at that point where they need something different. And this literally could be the answer for them. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly, for having me on. Absolutely. And again, please, if you enjoy this episode, please share it with someone who you think could benefit for, with it from it. And uh, thank you again, Becky, for being on today. Hey there. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope it serves you well to start rewiring your brain to create the life you desire. If you found value in this, please share it with a friend and tag me on Facebook or Instagram at Dr. Kelly Kessler. 